Hello, everyone, and welcome to NIDA Awareness Week, where everybody has a seat at the table. I love that title. I'm Eileen Fishman. I'm a social worker in private practice with specialization in the treatment of eating disorders, and I've been in the field for 36 years. I also helped found the National Eating Disorders Association um, and, and have been involved as a clinical advisor for many, many years, and I currently serve on the executive board of directors of NIDA. And today I am so pleased to be the moderator for the caregivers supporting ourselves while supporting others panel. And this is such an important topic. So I'm very excited about today's discussion and I want to introduce our panel to all of you. On our panel first we have Shannon Nunnally. And since Shannon's daughter was diagnosed with an eating disorder, Shannon has become tremendously involved as an advocate in the field. She's a member of the Eating Disorder Task Force of India, where she lives, lobbied in Washington, D.C. with the Eating Disorders Coalition, and has coordinated the Indianapolis Needle Walk for the last four years. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you. Michael Bacon is the father of two sons, ages 18 and 21. His younger son was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, major depression, and ARFID, which stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, in early 2020. Following five months of successful inpatient treatment, he reached his target weight late last summer. His son has returned to school while continuing weekly outpatient treatment and expects to graduate on time and attend college next fall. Yay, mm -hmm. welcome, Michael. Thank you. And Jay J.D. Olette is the mother of a 26-year-old in full lasting recovery from the anorexia that blindsided her daughter and their family at the age of 17. One of J.D.'s guiding principles in her advocacy and activism is that while families do not cause eating disorders, they must change to fight them. J.D. believes clinical care is most effective when it recognizes and supports familial change from a place of non-judgment and non-shame. Welcome, JD. I want to also um, underscore, JD, your concept of non-judgment, non-shame. I would also add non-guilt. You know, I think that I, I find that when families struggle um, with an eating disorder, there's a lot of question about how did this happen, why did this happen, and whose fault is it? And I often find families in my practice very, very defensive. So I, I encourage all of you to try to leave defensiveness at the door because it's just not, it's not helpful. As a parent, I know we all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean you cause your child's eating disorder. Um, I recently just published a book that's just out called The Deeper Fix. So I'm learning to self-promote. <laughs> and um, I have a chapter in there called Parents and the Blame Game because it's such an important issue um, about how we need to really leave blame behind. And we have to, um, as, as you say, JD, really rise to figure out how you can, whatever happened in the past, how can you get it right now? How can you use your energy and resources to really help your loved one get well? So again, thank you all for being here to discuss this important topic that does not get enough attention. So let's jump right in. Um, why is it important for the eating disorders community to hear the experience of caregivers? Why are you guys so important and why is this such an important topic? Whoever wants to start. Shannon, why don't you start? I think it's important just to give a caregiver, caregivers a voice. I think that it is, it is a very, can be a very scary, lonely time. And, you know, for our family, it, as JD said, it really blindsided us. I just, you know, our daughter was in her freshman year of college and we didn't know what hit us. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. And I think just having a voice and then um, being able to find some resources and support. And um, I think in that voice too, one thing that I found really, People didn't understand that my daughter was sick. Mm -hmm. People, it doesn't look like other sick sometimes, you know? And so I think that was really hard. And, you know, um, that was kind of frustrating at times. So I think that is just very, very important 
that we be able to have some resources to go to and um, and have that voice of that we are caregivers, you know, in this situation. Mm-hmm. And that eating disorders are not bad behavior. Exactly. Or, you know, that no one chooses to have an eating disorder. Exactly. And, and you're right, Sean, people don't get it. They don't understand, which makes it all the more challenging when mm-hmm. your family's um, grappling with that. Mm-hmm. Um, Michael, how about you? Uh, no, I, I agree with I agree with Shannon. What what, what Shannon said, you know, um, you know, when we each went through this, we we well, we all went through this for the first time. Hopefully, we only go through it once, but we all went through it for the first time. And there's so much you don't know, um, and there's so much that the professionals who you hope might help in this sometimes don't know. And so I think there's a validation that comes with hearing from caregivers uh, because you um, you can give yourself permission to have not understood, right? And to have not spotted it. Um, and it's also important because, you know, I mean, we we're talking about the age of each of our children who first experienced their eating disorder, you know, freshman in, in college, 17 year old, my son was, um, my son was 17 as well. And this is at an age where, you know, um, Maybe at any age you need help to figure this out. When it's happening to you, you don't understand what's happening. But particularly if you're talking about a child, um, you know, caregiver is critical because it's our job to try and figure these things out and try and be helpful. And there's um, this tremendously powerful uh, if if people don't feel um, uh, unhappy with themselves for not having figured it out and understanding that um, it's a process to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Again, not to blame yourselves, not to not to get wracked with guilt or weighed down by guilt because it's just so not helpful. Absolutely. Um, JD, how about you? Yeah, so I think that both of them are spot on. And I would add to that that the field in general really needs to listen to caregivers because uh, we hold a lot of information. Uh, one of my big passions is for a little bit higher weight, right? For not just sort of like barely meeting the minima and for for going over. And that came from my personal experience of seeing what happened with my daughter when that became in play. And I think there was a recent study, Erin Accurso from UC San Francisco was integral in doing, which which unearthed um, that caregivers define recovery very different from the clinical community. And so I always encourage parents, for me, recovery was when my daughter was back. She was herself the way she was, the the essence of her before. And um, nobody but the family is really going to be able to define that because, you know, the clinical people didn't know her before, right? And so I think it really broadens the conversation about what our goals are and, you know, how we can partner and how we can really improve, which, you know, right now, the we, we are just in a field where outcomes are not across the board great. And so, you know, we, I think we've been a missing piece of that puzzle and how we can get to that place um, of very full and lasting recovery for people. So I think it benefits patients is the number one reason that um, right. clinicians in the field want to listen to us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I like the word partnering because, because I, right, mm-hmm. you need to be partnering not only with your child, with your loved one, but also with the child's treatment team. Um, mm-hmm. You have a right to be an active partner and such an important partner also in their care. You know, NIDA started as an organization um, to really help families. That's mm-hmm. how we began, however many years ago, um, I think around 2000, but it was really about helping families and that's still one of NIDA's um, core, in our core mission is that we wanna help individuals and families because we know how devastating it is in families and um, also how families don't get enough support. So, um, you know, we know again how important this is and how important you all are in the journey and in the experience. Hi, um, Lane. Can I, yes. Hi, Lane, can I add something? I, in a, in a conversation, and it made me think of it, that I had with JD, she talked about lived experiences and mm. she really validated me in that my lived experience in this is really important, uh-huh. you know, and as a caregiver. And so I just, I think she really helped me see that, you know, my voice and my lived experience in this 
is really important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's so many professionals and you don't know what you're, you know, and so I just, I, it was very validating. And I think caregivers need to, he, you know, know that and hear that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to that point, um, for those of us, you know, on the other end of it, like everyone here has been through it, um, it's a, it's a skill set you're not getting anywhere else, right? It's just, and and one of the things I love about the treatment that I've been involved in, um, you know, in, in every facet was the understanding that um, there's all the book learning and the clinical stuff, and that's vitally important. And unless you sat at a table with a piece of your heart sitting on the other side, mm -hmm. having a reaction to eating, Mm -hmm. You cannot know. And we talk about that in the in the in the caregiver community. Like a lot of us, friendships with people who've never had eating disorders might never, there'll be a little piece of it that's never the same just because we've been through this really singular experience and um and you have to sort of honor that and learn from it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, you it's valid to expect that that your child's treatment team will will value your input. And that you know um, you will be learning from them, and they need to be learning from you. Yeah, definitely. So this goes right into the next question: What do uh, what role do caregivers play in their loved one's eating disorder recovery? Mm. So what role do you play, Michael? You want to start? Well, I you know as, as JD you know said like we 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 have the firsthand you know info on what's going on um, with, with um, you know, whoever it is we're caring for, whether it's a, a child at home or it's a partner or it's a parent or whomever, right? Doesn't matter the age, but we have the firsthand info of how the person is doing. We can observe, you know, um, them and can be an important sanity check or reality check uh, for, you know, are they slipping or are they doing well? Is their old, are they their old selves or are they something different? And what does that mean? And how can that influence treatment? Um, you know, I think um, at some stages of recovery, you know, we can be an important reinforcer of the skills um, and probably throughout, you know, mm -hmm. we can be an important reinforcer of the skills uh, that they learn in treatment. And, you know, obviously, if it's a, you know, a, a, a person who's either a young adult or a full adult, you, there's only so much of that you can do or want to do or should do, but there is some balance um, where, where your support can be critical to you know, helping them stay kind of between the guardrails and, and stay not just, you know, you know, to stay healthily, you know, at or above their, their target weight and, and practicing good habits. JD, what role do caregivers play? Yeah, I think, um, I think as you pointed out, it's a morphing role. And so it definitely depends on their age, their stage and all of that sort of thing. I think fundamentally the role we play is it's our responsibility to pull out all the stops to get an unhealthy kid healthy. So mm -hmm. um, fundamentally that that's part of it. It's compli more complicated in eating disorders, I think often because eating itself is like a societally fraught thing sometimes, weight societally fraught. Um, some people might have um, a no sickness or lack of insight, which is something my daughter had. So, you know, it kind of transitioned from you know, like pulling her kicking and screaming to then her being more well and having to have more buy-in. And I feel like we are now nine years out. So it's really um, morphed. And part of the way, um, once she was a little bit better that I think that I was very supportive and helpful for her was to help her um, be able to recognize and see patterns and in a more gentle way than initially with the you know nutritional rehabilitation, but help her begin to have insight to some of the things that might risk relapse or things like that. Um, so I think it's a sort of ever morphing um, sort of thing, but I think we're us being there with them is um, everyone I've talked to. Um, and I, I have actually had an amazing experience being on a NIDA panel in person mm -hmm. uh, where several um, adults came up to me afterwards and said, um, gosh, I wish my mom would have done that. And they were a little bit older and I said to them, you know what, I bet she would have, but she was told to do something different. Mm -hmm. So I'm just so happy for families to hear you saying continuing to stress partnership. And then for this idea that at whatever the age they are, um, you know, we're there sometimes to carry them, sometimes to walk with them, sometimes to cheer them from afar. 
um, you know, and all of those places are important. Mm -hmm. Shannon. Um, I would agree wholeheartedly. You know, it really is a continuum, you know, and kind of an ebb and flow, how it changed and grew. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think in the beginning, if, you know, when my daughter was in a, a very unhealthy place or a, um, a dangerous place at times, you know, it was as protector and advocate mm -hmm. and, you know, no bones about it, no nonsense. And um, and that can be really hard. And you know, some not so nice words are thrown at you. And um, you, over time, learn to develop a pretty thick skin. Um, but it's all out of love. And um, I think as you as you go along that continuum um, and find your role, it's um, you know, how am I best serving the situation? And um, I also think, you know, that role is like JD said, with the entire family, you know, how are we fitting into that? And, you know, we did a lot of family days and some family therapy and um, different things um, like that, that, that helped us fit in. And, you know, kind of a few years down now, down the road and, um, you know, my daughter will often say, I have to remember you're my mom, not my therapist, you know, mm -hmm. and, and staying in that lane. But it is as she's gotten older and we've gotten, you know, um, you know, on the towards, you know, full recovery. It's um, it's a really neat bonding space that we're in. And I always, you know, it's. Um, you know, there, there, is a, there is a lot of beauty and hope that comes in that recovery and, and um, that relationship that you forged. But it took a lot of love and work and boundaries wow. and, um, to, to get there. And I would, I, and I would, I would just add, um, you know, Shannon, I think, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you've, you've got to have skin in the game and it's not just skin in the game like, you know, you're advocating for your sick child, right? You, you've got to have skin in the game in terms of being willing to reflect on how did we get here? And this is kind of what you were talking about, Eileen, in your book, and I'm sure you've got a question that will take us here. But, you know, it, 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 one, you have to be open to, to really digging into what, how did you get here? Not that it's about blame, but it's really about understanding. You know, with, with our son, he had some great behaviors, which, you know, became super maladaptive, right? You know, what was a strength became like his, you know, mm -hmm. the thing that took him down. It's and we didn't recognize it and we contributed to it because before, when, before we realized it was maladaptive, we thought it was still awesome. Mm -hmm. And so when we finally got to the point and had to start digging into where did this come from, you know, we had to you know, acknowledge and, and, and account for some of the choices that we had made that contributed to it. And then not to dwell in that, but to think about, okay, so that's fine. That happened. It's not anybody's fault necessarily. It just is what it is. What do we do from here and how do we need to change? And, and that's, that's very different than, you know, I'm going to find the best doctor and I'm going to go visit them at a hospital every day and I'm going to watch their portion size. And that's like, okay, how do I need to change as a parent or as a caregiver to help this person? And that's a much deeper level of, of commitment, which wasn't obvious to us at, at first, but was critical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I often say yeah. to families that I don't believe any family caused an eating disorder, and I believe all families have to change to fight one. This exactly. isn't just stuff that we're, you know, this is sort of a, we've leveled up in parenting, right? And so <laughs> you have not been playing with, you know, the skills that it's required to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think it's it takes a, a strength a, you never knew you had. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not what happens to us, it's how we rise to it. Mm -hmm. And it really is, it's a crisis in any family. It really is an opportunity. If you can rise to it, um, you can also role model for your kids how to deal with a challenge like this, and how to grow and change, how to struggle to be open. As we're asking our kids to get healthier, we're asking our kids to change and recover from their eating disorders. Um, if they can see, see, you know, parents and family also 
stretching and growing, it's really helpful. And I have families who choose not to, you know, change and get healthier and their kids still get well. But, and it's also, but always really wonderful for me when I, when I meet families where I really watch them willing to do the hard work themselves as well. It's not just about getting their kid well, they want to get, they want to use the opportunity to get healthier. And also I want to say how eating disorders, and you all know this, affect the whole family. It's not just the child who has your eating disorder, right? It's you have other children, um, it's extended family, everyone is impacted by the eating disorder. And it is a potential growth opportunity for the entire family system. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I, I go ahead. Tidy, when you do that, um, Shannon mentioned beauty, right? That there is some, there is beauty in the journey. And when you decide, when you make that decision, um, and again, not as, as Michael said, it's no shame, no blame. And I always kind of say, like, if you're looking backwards, you can't see where you're going. So, you know, turn around. Um, but yeah, the beauty on the other end of it really ends up with, in our case, like you learning so much from your child as well. Um, they are able to then teach you really amazing things and um, the bonds. I think because it, in the beginning, it's almost always there's confrontation and conflict and so much pain involved. It's really hard to see how it could end up with a lot of beauty, but really just about all the families I know that have been through this, um, you know, end up with stronger, closer, healthier, you know, everything is just a little bit more mindful in the way you walk through things. And mm -hmm. also, you know, sometimes rejecting some stuff that Michael, I think you alluded to that maybe we never considered were toxic, you know, especially I, I actually yeah. come from an education background and some of it related to education and like, there is such a thing as too many AP classes and why aren't we on the race to nowhere? And then, and wait, going to college, the semester after you graduate from high school, that's pretty arbitrary and we don't have to do that. And so it, it's some, in some ways just feels like super freeing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All such really important points. I wanna underscore boundaries and mm -hmm. attunement to boundaries. How do you love so much and wanna help so much and care so much um, and yet have to really learn those boundaries? Um, so I wonder if you could all just speak for a moment to what you've learned about boundaries, because I know I talk about this and see this in all of my um, my patients who are struggling with eating disorders and also within the family system. So Shannon, do you want to speak to boundaries? Um, I think um, boundaries were really hard to learn. I spent some time in Al-Anon. Uh, with another um, one of my children and so I had learned kind of that I didn't cause this and it you know and would mm -hmm. took Great. a lot of principles and um, but in the beginning when I was so blindsided and we didn't know anything I mean she had some behaviors that we were actually thought were okay and they were not and mm -hmm. Um, then you're scrambling because they say you got to go to treatment and you got to do this and I don't know where to go and what to do and I'm scared and um, and there was some pretty tough times and I distinctly remember um, we have been through quite a few therapists and one of the first ones that we met in one of the treatment centers um, really spoke to the issue of boundaries because I was a crying mess. I just, I was, I, I, I didn't know what to do. And um, I was very much of a, you know, pleaser, fixer, and I was gonna fix this. And we thought the first time she went to treatment, she was fixed and we were good. And, and, and that's not, you know, and so we had to learn, you know, like, like JD was saying, like we had so much to learn. And one of the big things was boundaries and learning how to set them and stick with them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, she has a dual diagnosis. So we had, you know, when uh, several things going on and, um, you know, we really had to learn within learning about boundaries that, you know, the eating disorder was separate. You know, the eating disorder was was what was spewing at me or, you know, and um, really um, develop, you know, that's how we kind of learned how to develop boundaries. Like she, she was not the eating disorder, you know, it was what was raging. And um, so I think when I kind of really learned to separate that, it was easier 
to set those boundaries and to stick with them. And, you know, I'm not going, he taught me to sit, I'm not going to engage with you right now. And just, right, it, right. Cause you're you know, entitled to your boundaries, just like your yeah. child is entitled to and, their and boundaries. I never had that. I never knew to have that and to be able to, to be taught that, that I'm not going to engage with you right now. I'm not going to answer that right now. And your child sometimes is entitled too to say, I can't do this right now. Right. So the boundaries go both ways. Mm -hmm. JD, do you have any thoughts about boundaries? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think as, as Shannon was talking about, like in the beginning, our boundaries were very much around the eating disorder and we had very strong boundaries about what we would let the eating disorder do with mm -hmm. to our child. Um, and it was super uncomfortable. And I often tell people like, almost the more sort of compassionate, collaborative parent you are, the more ill-prepared you are to do this segment of it. Um, and then, you know, once that initial critical phase is over, again, it's that reformulation process because there does become a time where you have to like sort of put a boundary on what is now your child's to do and mm -hmm. yours to do and the work that you have to do because maybe it was safe to have a lot of control, safe and appropriate, and now, that will hold you back. So you kind of have to reformulate those boundaries. And I think it's a, it's a very continual process, but I really do agree. Um, I had been to Al-Anon earlier in my life um, related to my family of origin and just overall the experience of learning in Al-Anon about some of that was, was actually very helpful, I think, and equipped me well to do this. Mm -hmm. Good. Michael, any thoughts about boundaries? Yeah, I'm still trying to find them exactly. Yeah. <laughs> to, to JD's point, you know, they keep moving, right? It's morphing, uh, right? They keep morphing. Yeah. Yep. And, and mm -hmm. you know, I think in in our case, um, I mean, we have a an 18 year old, you know, son, and uh, you know, so you know, like, did you talk about what does it look like when they're normal? Well, when it's normal, like he never comes out of his room and he never talks to us, and it's so it's, <laughs> you know, what does a boundary look like? And is it too much of a, you know, I think part of our issue was we gave him too much room, right? Mm -hmm. We let him eat in his room. Yeah. Um, and, you know, because he was, if he wasn't at school, he was at sports practice, or he was in his room doing homework, or he was asleep. I mean, that was it. That was like mm -hmm. seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And, you know, so I, I think like my boundary meter was broken, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Clearly. Yeah. Um, and so figuring out what new boundaries look like, it's A, it's a moving target and B, you know, I think if we'd been better with boundaries, we might not have gotten exactly where we got. And so, you know, for me, it, there's a lot of um, trying to get feedback from his, his therapist. You know, we do a family therapy session. You know, he's, we now patient treatment now. We do a family therapy session, you know, once a month. Um, right. We try to talk about those issues. His, right. his multiple therapists during inpatient treatment were incredibly helpful in suggesting mm -hmm. mechanisms, you know, mm -hmm. methods um, uh, that helped us identify boundary issues and how to handle them. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the JD's point is, is spot on. It's it's a moving target. Uh, mm -hmm. And and my my comment would be, you know, maybe my boundary picker was broken in the first place. And so mm -hmm. take all the help you can get um, mm -hmm. and cut yourself some slack uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. And I'm also thinking as you're speaking about communication, right? So a lot of times as you're struggling with, with your child's illness and recovery, you start walking on eggshells because you don't want to make things worse. You're afraid. What if you mention that? And you, you, know, you don't want to you know, uh, rock the apple cart, um, but you need to learn how to communicate. You need to risk communication, even if you get it wrong and you can say, okay, I got that wrong. I'm just trying to talk to you, whatever. Um, and, and communication is critical. Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, and you actually to something Michael I think is important when you were talking about boundaries that I also think in terms of there's boundaries for us with our child our child with us and I think it should also be part of your professional support and clinical team whatever what's up as well and I often am encouraging parents to have boundaries of like progress has to be made I have to know what the progress is I have to know what the treatment goals are yes. all of those sorts of things and so that's another set of boundaries that I really want to empower people to have um, treatment for any mental illness in your adolescent or young adult, um, you know, it sort of depends, young adult over 18, there's other things that come into play with that, but, um, you know, sort of in a general sense should never be, you just drop them off or turn on the computer now during COVID, 
and then you don't know anything, right? You're entitled, your boundary will be, I need to know what the plan is. I need to right. know how to evaluate the progress. I need to right. see that it's happening. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I totally agree. So I, I, wanted, to make made a, I, I wanted to jump in, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I agree with JD's, JD's point, but I wanna go back to your comment about walking on eggshells. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, mm -hmm. so we're living at home, working at home because it's COVID, right? <laughs> right. So what is, what is one of the things that happens like the most? Well, instead of a few meals a week in the house, like every meal ever is in the house. So what is one of the biggest household chores? Anything having to do with food and the kitchen. So for weeks, we resisted asking months, we resisted asking our recovering son to do any kitchen related chores. Okay. And like, eventually we got fed up. We were like, we do all the cooking, we do all the dishes, we take out the trash, we do the coffee maker. Like, we, what does this kid do? Like, we gotta go back to first principles, right? And so we, we went to the therapist and we were like, we really think it would be helpful if we could ask him to do a little something, but we don't wanna ask too much. Like, can he take mm -hmm. out the trash? And the therapist was like, well, of course he can take out the trash. <laughs> to your point about eggshells is you have to, it's just, it, 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 you, that is a real risk is that you, you pull back and, and even, you know, things which are really straightforward and make a lot of sense and would be about, you know, empowerment actually, um, and, and, and equity and recovery. And right. you, 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 you pull back, you shrink from them because you're afraid. Um, and about healthy self-esteem, right? Because when we do chores, we gain healthy self-esteem. So we don't want to do the opposite, which is to protect our precious kids who are, you know, ill. Right. Um, right. So finding that healthy balance and um, helping them to feel good about themselves by finding the right, you know, where's that sweet spot? What, what, how much can you ask of your kids? What's healthy and helpful to them? But that's also, again, boundaries and listening and attunement mm -hmm. and communication so that you can bring these things out in the open and have discussion and, and work it out together. We would have check-ins at home, you know, where there was a period where she couldn't be in school in college and she was, her job was to go to therapy once she was out of one of her treatments and we would have check-ins, you know, mm -hmm. we, that was kind of a boundary. We need mm -hmm. to have a check-in, you know, yeah. my husband and I with her, and sometimes we would sit with family members, you know, and that was absolutely you know. appropriate. And with the treatment team, I really mm -hmm. encourage that. I want to make sure that we get to, I want to ask all of you how you take care of yourselves, right? Mm -hmm. It's like on the airplane with the mask. Remember airplanes? <laughs> anyway, um, with the mask, like that you have to take care of yourselves first so that you can take care of your loved ones. So what kind of advice can you give everyone about self-care? Um, JD, you start. Yeah, so um, this one is something that really interests me, and I know in the very beginning when I began to hear it, um, when I was in a place where it was just sort of impossible for me, I had a full-time job, I was by myself, I had a kid in PHP, you know, I barely, like, what are you talking about? Like, you're adding, it felt like you just a rock in my backpack, uh, another rock in my very full backpack, and then, you know, someone talked to me about it in a way of doing it sort of in like really small chunks. And, and for me, that led to me realizing I had to drive a lot for my job as well. So sometimes I was driving 200 miles a day and I was a um, NPR listener. So one day I realized, I think I've heard the, this same really sad story for the third time. What am I doing to myself, right? And so for me, it became a conscious choice. I will only listen to music while I'm driving mm. and like pop music, right? I'm not, into, I, I'm not trying to deep think here, right? I just want to be distracted. That was hugely helpful. So I, I tell people for a long time in the initial stages, it was pop music and car dancing kept me sane. And then, you know, as things got a little bit easier, that morphed into sort of other things. And that's that place too with boundaries, right? Where you, it might be easy to hold on too tight to sort of what you're doing, but then you're kind of keeping you all back. And so then I need, did need to find a way to go to happy hour with my friends like I used to do sometimes or take a walk by myself or, you know, if you're really into it, you know, for me, I was, because we were together all the time when she was home, I wasn't exercising and I, you know, ate a lot of fettuccine Alfredo. And so it, you know, that transition back to self-care becoming, yeah, I am now allowed to 
change some of this. I can go out and eat a salad and not feel guilty. I can go for, you know, a walk myself and all of that kind of stuff. So starting to disentangle the support and just finding places. And I also think it's really important to acknowledge um, when you're in the early stage of this, this crying is self-care. Yes, crying absolutely. Self-care, yeah. like mm -hmm. schedule your crying if you need to cry, like whatever it is, that mm -hmm. is a really important part of it. You're allowed to be sad and grieve about this really hard thing you're going to. And that's an act of self-care as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Absolutely. Shannon, how do you, what do you think about self-care? Um, I, for me, in the beginning, I got my own therapist, um, which was something I really needed. To, I had one of her therapists suggested that, and it was one of the best things that I ever did because we had a lot of different types of therapists and I needed a place that was safe for me. And when she was in treatment and calling me and like, so I didn't, like if I was in therapy, I didn't answer the phone. I distinctly remember that, having that boundary of not answering the phone. Um, so I spent some time in therapy for me and for myself and working through this and crying. I did lots of crying and that's okay. Yeah. And, and finding that safe person to to talk to at work a lot of people at work didn't understand and um i wish i would have done a better job at keeping a journal um i i did kind of reflect on my story for a talk i did and i wish i would have you know um done that but i think for me like jd said um my self-care has turned into a passion and turned into an advocacy for eating disorder awareness and that's what drives me now you know doing this being um a, an advocate and a voice and um that has kind of what my self-care has really um turned into and you know and um you know it, it's a lot of ups and downs and but really um and enjoying the beauty on the other side. I mean, I can't say that I, I, I can say that, you know, I mean, there's a lot of positives that have come out of this and um, which is a, a nice place to be. I have learned and, and changed. Yeah, and I think, and I, yeah, Shannon, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I feel, um, you know, p part of what you're trying to do with self-care is you're trying to recapture some of your own agency and 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 feel like you're a little bit more in control uh, of of things because you're completely out of control when this the you know blindsides you you know the words you both jd and, and shannon you both used and it was the same the same for us and so i think you know be, being an advocate and and sharing your story um and talking to others you know i've been amazed you know, having opened up to a number of, of people about what our family's been through, I've been amazed at how many people said, you know, yes. somebody in my family had an eating disorder too. I was shocked. You know, it was like, I said to my wife, it's like miscarriages, you know, it's something that mm -hmm. people have yeah. them, but they don't talk about them. And when you say you've had one, because my mother-in-law had several, you know, you hear a flood of stories. And so that's mm -hmm. been really empowering is, 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 is sharing um, and, and advocacy and things like this. And obviously JD and Shannon are doing, you know, all kinds of great work in this regard. And you too, Eileen, we're just, mm -hmm. I'm just a new, newbie here. Um, but the other things that um, are important, I think uh, JD hit all the, uh, JD and Shannon hit all the big ones. It's, um, it's uh, uh, therapy, emotions, exercise, and um, mm -hmm. in my case, ice cream. Um, so <laughs> it's was fettuccine Alfredo, but you know, mm -hmm. Therapy is, is, I think, critical. My wife and I have had a therapist throughout this process because we needed a place together as the parents of our son to go and to talk about things and to build on the lessons and think about the change that we needed to embrace. Um, uh, emotions, uh, you know, you both JD and Shannon talked about, you know, crying and you know, the, it, opening yourself up to the full range of emotion, right, mm -hmm. is critical. Um, exercise, if you can do it, great. Tends to make you feel better generally, especially during COVID. Um, and ice cream doesn't make me feel good the next day, but it makes me feel really good at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm okay. With, I'm okay with that. And the last thing is um, just giving yourself more permission, cutting yourself more slack. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're a hard-driving family. Our son is a hard-driving kid. That's part of how we got here. 
and you know, both modeling the behavior for him, but also from your own mental health is saying, you know what, I don't need to accomplish that to today. You know, I've, I've just been a good day. I put on my pajamas, I watch a little television, have a drink, talk with my kids, whatever. So I think that's also important. Sometimes we talk about in your life as an important part of self-care, like you have your glass balls and your rubber balls, right? And so the glass ball is gonna be your kid, your kid's recovery, keeping your family together. And then there's a whole lot of stuff you think you have to do. It's actually a rubber ball that can bounce around on the ground for a while and it's not gonna, it's not, you know, no, nothing's gonna happen. Nobody's gonna die over that. And that's, an, that's one of those lessons that then lasts, you know, past the experience. I wanted to also say that um, connection, as everyone has mentioned, um, Shannon and I know each other. Um, I mean, we live in very different parts of the country. We never would have met that kind of stuff. So um, the eating disorder parent support community is really like the best people you will ever meet in your life. Um, it's mm -hmm. astonishing. You know, a lot of people are like, I would you not want to just like never mm -hmm. think about that again? And I'm like, I, because you just want to help the next person that's coming. Mm -hmm. And it tends to happen when I see people, when people come into parent communities um, online and things like that, um, it's like they're learning for one week and then the next week they're still learning, but they're also helping the person that just joined yesterday. And it's mm -hmm. really beautiful and empowering for people to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. That's great in terms of connection. Um, and mm -hmm. that is so important in terms of uh, self-care, getting what you need and not, you know, loving your child doesn't mean that you have to suffer with them. Your eating mm -hmm. disorder is your child's, mm -hmm. right? It, you can support them, you can help them, but it's not yours. So you can still, you know, enjoy your lives and you can still, you know, I know I, I have family sometimes they don't want to go out, they don't want to leave their child, they cancel vacations, whatever. And sometimes that's appropriate. And that's part of the attunement and the communication. But other times it's like, wait, you've got to live your lives. Mm -hmm. This is not about punishment and it's not about you know, joining the suffering. It's about how can we all get healthier? What do we all need? And you all have your own needs as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, this was really a great panel. Um, before I wrap up, is there any last word, anything that we didn't touch on that you want to share with everyone? Anybody? Mm -hmm. I mean, this was great. I'm not, not that we need more, this was great. <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you so much for joining this important discussion. And I hope that everyone watching has found this information helpful. And tune in throughout the week, um, NIDA Awareness Week. Um, there are many more roundtable discussions. There's much to, um, to partake in. And um, uh, we wish you all well. I hope that your families all continue to get well, your loved ones, your children. And thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.